Good day, I'm Father Tom, and the name of the telecast is In Season and Out of Season, and we've been doing this for 150 years, it seems, but we're still doing it. That's what you say, pump it out. I hope it's more than just pumping things out. I hope that when I say something that's from the Word of God, that you listen. I hope. I hope that what I say, not because I say it, isn't like water that, c that just literally falls off a duck's back. Like, I hope that what I say has an effect on you. Because you know what? The Word of God is seed, and seeds grow. Even in the winter they grow. Not outdoors, but in pots. Seeds grow, and the Word of God takes root in the hearts of people. Now, I'm going to be reading from the scripture today from St. Matthew's Gospel, the 10th chapter. And it's a very simple scripture. You've heard it over and over and over again. I call this the instructions of Jesus to his disciples. You know, I don't know about you, but I've been given instructions. When I make meatballs, I have instructions, and they're not written down, but these are the instructions. Let me tell you. You can even take the recipe down. These are the instructions. They're in my head. What I do is I get a chuck roast or another roast that's on sale at one of the supermarkets, and I have it ground. So that's the first thing. It might be five pounds. If it's five pounds, I'll put in about maybe six or seven eggs. All right? With six or seven eggs, uh, it's fine. And I'll also put in a couple of uh, handfuls of breadcrumb that's uh, flavored, Italian breadcrumb. All right? Then what I put in is cheese, like like maybe three big handfuls of cheese, and then some salt and some pepper, and then I just mix it up with my hands for a consistency, and then I put a little hot water in it. Some people put milk. Those are the instructions for making meatballs. Then I form the meatball, and I fry it in I don't fry it in olive oil. I don't like to waste olive oil. I fry it in vegetable oil. The best thing is to eat a meatball after it's been fried. It's like dying and go to heaven. Now, what I'm saying is just this whole thing about instructions. So I gave you the instructions of my meatballs. All right? Now, Jesus gave instructions to his apostles and to the church. Can I tell you that Jesus hasn't changed? I don't know how I can say this, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus hasn't changed. The thing that's changed is our faith. We just don't believe anymore. So this is what Jesus does, and he gives instructions. He says to the twelve, he sent them forth, having instructed them. There's the word. Do not go in the direction of the Gentiles. Do not enter into the Samaritan towns, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So what's the first instruction? Do not go into Gentile areas. Do not go into Samaritan areas. You are, go, you are to go to those people who are Jewish, the lost sheep of Israel. They don't know that other people will be going to Samaria and other people will be going to uh, the Gentiles after his resurrection. But these are the instructions. Don't go to Gentile regions, people that aren't Jewish. Don't go to Samaritan regions. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay, those are part of the instructions. And as you go, preach the message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. 
And how are you going to show that? Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and cast out demons. These are instructions. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. That's a, those are the instructions. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not keep gold or silver or money in your pockets. No wallet for your journey, not two tunics, no sandals, no staff, because the laborer deserves his wages. Okay. So Jesus gives instructions to the church, not only to the church back then, but to us. These are the instructions of Jesus. These are not my instructions, okay? These are Jesus' instructions. Now, I just gave you instructions for meatballs. If you follow my instructions, you'll have good meatballs. All right? If we follow the instructions of Jesus, things are going to happen. First, cure the sick. Second, raise the dead. Hello? Raise the who? Raise the dead. Third, cleanse lepers. Fourth, what's the fourth one now? Cast out demons. Now, these instructions are given to us, too. Not to the world, but to the church. That we are to proclaim the kingdom of God and we are to show it is near at hand. How? By praying for the sick, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, casting out demons. All right? Now, is your church a healing church? How many people get healed in your church? Is my church a healing church? How many people get healed in my church? Now, I'm going to tell you at this point, I've not raised anyone from the dead. But you want to know what? Jesus said it. And whenever Jesus says, I think he means it. I will tell you a story about someone being raised from the dead. And this is true. You might not believe it, but you don't have to believe it. You really don't have to believe it. Because it's true anyway. Whether I believe it or not doesn't make it true. It's true anyway. In Mozambique, this woman, her name is Heidi Baker, she has many, many homes of young boys and girls who are orphaned. These children have literally been left at her door because half of the children in Mozambique die before five years old. So when a parent cannot take care of their children, they leave them at the different homes that Heidi Baker has. In each home, there is a mother. And the mother is there to be the mother of the children. It is not an orphanage. It's a home. And it's a home with a mother. And the mother really adopts these children in her heart. So this mother was in charge of a young boy's home. As a matter of fact, one home said, you know, the boys that I'm in charge of, I've got them even to share their chicken with each other. She said, that's a big miracle because they never had enough food to eat. But now my boys will share their chicken with each other. That's a big miracle because now they realize they're not going to be deprived. So this mother in charge of these boys, receives a call one day. And the call is her son, her blood son, her biological son, was in a terrible accident and he died. And his body was mangled. So the mother who lost her son says, 
to the children, I must leave Mozambique and I must go and bury my son. The children were very sad. One child said to the mother, Mother, Jesus raises the dead. We know Jesus raises the dead. Well, the mother was in grief and the mother didn't even answer. And the mother went to the other country in Africa to bury her son. These children began to pray with faith. Hour after hour, night after night, day after day, in the reality that Jesus raises the dead. They continued to pray. They prayed out of love. They prayed out of love. Well, the mother goes to see her dead son, and there he is in the casket, mangled. They're just about to bury him, and his mother wants to say his, her last goodbye. She's crying. She just touches the son on the hand. With that, the son wakes up. And all the mangled parts of his body are completely healed. Now, you don't have to believe it. But those children loved their mother so much that they prayed and prayed and prayed that this boy would come back to his biological mother. Jesus said, when you go into a town, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. Those are the instructions. Let me tell you another story. There was a doctor, and I was reading about this, I wish I had brought it. There was a doctor who is a, one of the most famous cardiologists in the United States. He believes in medicine. He also believes in prayer. And he started to believe in prayer because he started to see impossible things happen to his patients. Prayer in the name of Jesus. But he believes in the best medicine. He believes in the best techniques of operations. He believes in it all. Okay? He's not a quack. Anyway, this man had been brought into the uh, emergency room with chest pain. And what happens to the poor man? He takes a heart attack and dies on the floor. The doctors and the nurses get him on the table and for 45 minutes are working with him to no avail. After 45 minutes, they quit. His hands are black, his feet are black, his body is rigid. They called uh, the cardiologist that I'm talking about into the room and the cardiologist looked and said, you know, just stop now, he's dead. He's not coming back. The cardiologist turned on his feet to walk away. And the Lord said, I want you to pray for him. And so the cardiologist turned around, laid his hand on the guy, and this is what his prayer was. Father, if this man did not know Jesus Christ, bring him back. With that, life started to pour into this man. But not only that, the man tells, when I died, I saw my funeral, and I knew it was mine, and I knew I was dead. But then there was someone that brought me back. His name was Bob. I think it was my guardian angel. 
And when he brought me back, I was in my daughter's arms. Now, you might not believe that story either. But you know what? It's true. And the next time I come, I want to read it to you. Because it's very, it's very potent. And I give the doctor's name, and you can, e you can Google his name, and you can see if these things are true. You can do it yourself. I once told you the story about the little child. Do you remember the little child who was going to have a new brother? Do you remember that story? I do. I cry every time I say it. Hey, well, this new little brother was coming, and they had prepared the room for this little brother. But toward the end of the pregnancy, ultrasound said that this little brother was going to be born, but wasn't going to last very long. It was like the, the most terrible thing in the whole world. But this little brother that was on the earth used to sing every single day to his, to his brother in his mother's tummy. And he used to sing, You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Well, the baby was born, and was born very sickly, and they gave the baby three or four days to live. But the mother wanted the elder brother to visit the baby before he died. And the nurse was a real ogre. She didn't want it to happen, but the mother said, this child will visit his brother. Remember, he had sung every day to this little baby while he was still in the womb. And so they dressed the kid up, you know, with mask and gloves and all this. He looks like something out of Mars. And he sees his little brother, and he begins. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. And even as he began to sing, strength poured into that baby. The ogre nurse was completely dumbfounded. In several days, the baby was released and went home. I want to tell you this. I'm going to tell you how they raise the dead in Mozambique when it comes to infants. Because you know, an infant shouldn't die. The worst thing in the world is to bury a newborn baby. I've buried many people, but there is nothing worse than burying a newborn. Everyone had expected so much, and now the child is dead. Well, these people in Mozambique believe that God has a destiny for everybody, and that babies shouldn't die. So they do the best they can to raise them from the dead. Let me tell you how they do it. They will leave dead babies on their doorstep, and a mother, a mother in the home, will take that baby, will fondle that baby, hold that baby, will love that baby, and will, this is a dead baby now, and will call life back into that baby, night and day, day and night. Now, it sounds kind of stupid, because the baby is dead. Sometimes three or four days, they've had 18 infants raised from the dead. 
Oh, every infant is not raised from the dead, but 18 have been raised. But it's love that raises people from the dead. It's love that heals the little brother. It's love, the love of God, that heals the sick. You see, it really is all about love. The love of God on the cross. The love of God poured out by the Holy Spirit given to us. You see, I guess if we're American, this is how we'd want to raise the dead. We'd want to put our hand on the dead person and say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. But that's not the way they do it. They love. They call back life. They call back life. That God would send this life back to this infant. And sometimes it's three or four days, 24 hours, seven, 24 hours a day, praying. Jesus gave instructions, but you know what? We really don't believe Jesus. We think that Jesus was some kind of a magician, but he wasn't. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. And he taught his church how to do the same thing. Now, whether we want to do it or not is another issue. But these are the instructions. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. Cast out demons. Tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The other day I prayed with about seven people who were healed of deafness. Seven. I don't know the degree of the deafness, but I will tell you this. I had them walk from one end of the ballroom to the other, and every time I asked them to stop, I said, could you hear me and what I'm saying? They said yes. I said, take five steps. They take five more steps. Then I'd say something else. Could you hear me? Yes. Take five steps. And they took five more, until they reached the end of the ballroom. And they could hear me from one end to the other. I wasn't screaming. Only one lady didn't get her hearing back. I don't understand it, but I do know the instructions have been given by Jesus. You see, he died for our sins, but he also died to heal our hearts and to heal our bodies. And that's what we celebrate during Lent, during Easter. But I guess it takes a little faith to believe that. And you know what? Not too many people have faith. Not too many people have faith. And that's kind of too bad. Because when you don't have faith, you have to face every crisis on your own power. And that's terrible. That's worse than terrible. When you don't have faith, you have to face every crisis alone. My Lord, our Lord Jesus gave us instructions. But you know what? We don't believe Jesus. It's kind of bad. That's why churches are closing. Because we don't believe Jesus. We don't believe Jesus. I don't know who we believe, but we don't believe Jesus. And that's kind of sad. So what is the church for? I don't know. It's certainly not a house of prayer in most places. They lock the doors after Mass. It's not a place of healing because no one gets healed. Today, a young child was throwing a ball against the window of our door, so they don't even know that the holy 
The Blessed Sacrament is there. What are churches for? To heat? Or to bring life? I prophesy right now, if the churches of God, Catholic and Protestant and Orthodox, do not bring life and healing, they will close. They will close. They will close. You know why? Because God gave us the church to bring life and healing to the lost, to the sick, and to the desperate. And if we do not do that, I prophesy, they will close. For what good are they? What good are buildings unless people can feel the presence of the loving Christ? Be healed and be blessed. What good are they? If the purpose of the church is fulfilled to follow the instructions of Jesus, they will close. And that's a very sad thing because the power of God is available for you. May Almighty God bless you and you should be healing the sick too, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but always in the name of Jesus, always through his blood. God bless you.